Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The U.S. reportedly knew about the Chinese spy balloon as soon as it launched. And the latest from the White House on threats of retaliation from Beijing. The national debt is on track to become a record-breaking share of the economy in five years. What Democrat leader Chuck Schumer tells us is the solution. Republican senators hope to all but require medical providers to treat patients who haven't taken the COVID-19 vaccine. Can the bill get past Senate Democrats? The DOJ says it will not press charges against Republican Congressman Matt Gates in a sex trafficking probe. And a judge sentences a gunman who killed 10 people in a supermarket last year. Some of the relatives of the victims let their emotions go during the hearing. She was a beautiful girl. New information about the Chinese spy balloon. Multiple outlets citing anonymous U.S. officials say the U.S. had tracked it from the start. NTD's Iris Tao has more from the White House. The U.S. could have been tracking the Chinese by balloon for longer than we thought. That's according to new reports by the Washington Post and CBS, which cited anonymous officials in saying that a U.S. military had been tracking the Chinese spy balloon for nearly a week before shooting it down, and was even watching as the balloon took off from China's south coast. The State Department, however, would not confirm that to me on Wednesday. Can you confirm reports that the U.S. had been tracking the Chinese spy balloon ever since it took off from the Chinese south coast? I, I'm not in a position to speak to that. That is a question for my colleagues at the, at the Pentagon, so I need to refer you. The Pentagon did not get back to us before airtime. Meanwhile, officials also told the Washington Post that the analysts are now looking into the possibility that China didn't intend to send a spy balloon all the way into the American heartland. The U.S. says that does not matter. Senators who got briefed on China again on Wednesday said the same. Whether or not it uh, was purposeful or was deviated by wind patterns is something the Chinese are still responsible for once they send that balloon uh, into space. Even going over Guam, it's about sensitive information uh, of United States uh, defense capabilities. Meanwhile, Beijing is now threatening to retaliate. After the U.S. shot down China's balloon and announced sanctions against Chinese aerospace companies, Beijing said Wednesday that it would take countermeasures against U.S. entities that, quote, undermine China's sovereignty. He asked the State Department for the U.S.'s response. Uh, the PRC's attempts to uh, accuse us uh, of doing the same. It is uh, just more misinformation, disinformation. Uh, it is just not true. Meanwhile, lawmakers are calling on President Biden to formally address the nation about the Chinese by balloon and three other objects, all downed in just over a week. And the White House is now reportedly considering for Biden to give a speech on this topic this week. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. Next, let's hear from a counterintelligence expert for his analysis of these reports. Casey Fleming is the CEO of Black Ops Partners Corporation, and I spoke with him earlier today. Casey Fleming, welcome to our show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Reports from multiple outlets say the U.S. was tracking the Chinese spy balloon from its liftoff. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's entirely possible. When you understand the counterintelligence and our intelligence capability, uh, you would have to assume that that is entirely possible. What more do you think the U.S. should be doing now in regards to this Chinese spy balloon situation? The U.S. really should be educating uh, the American people and raising the awareness to really what the threat is. The FBI has done that in numerous occasions over the past three and four years, and most specifically since last summer in July, um, that the true most significant threat to the United States and our future is China. And once again, there's only one China and it's completely controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. So people have to understand that. So when we buy things from China, you know, the U.S. really needs to be saying, hey, no more foreign investment in China and also no more foreign investment and influence in the United States by China. We can't buy things over there. We can't access their Internet. Why are they accessing ours and why are they buying farmland and, and businesses and buildings and so on? 
And you've said that this spy balloon incident should be an aha moment for the American people to 100%. wake up to the China threat. 100%. Do you, do you think that these latest reports could also influence how Americans see the administration's stance on China? 100%. Like I said, Americans are always, you know, they're not really good on stealth uh, moves and interpreting stealth moves, but they're old fashioned people, Americans, as well as human nature across the board. You know, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, you're seeing it. And the same thing with social media and all these type of things. It's you're seeing an incredible ramp up of psychological warfare, narrative warfare, all these things that are part of unrestricted warfare. The big umbrella is unrestricted warfare. These are all other different methods underneath that. Again, from the CCP perspective to win the war without fighting. So scare the American people, weaken them, make them fearful of themselves and their country and uh, you know, at some point, we'll just walk on and, and help them out, take them over. A scary thought there. Thank you so much. Casey Fleming, CEO of Black Ops Partners Corporation. Appreciate Thanks your time. Thanks for having me. Senator Marco Rubio is raising the alarm over Ford Motors' deal with a Chinese battery company. He says he wants to make sure no U.S. funds go to the Chinese company, especially in light of the recent Chinese spy balloon. The senator says the deal will only deepen U.S. reliance on the Chinese Communist Party for battery tech. Rubio also says he thinks it's likely designed to make the factory eligible for Inflation Reduction Act tax credits. Ford, on the other hand, argues that the new plant would create 2,500 jobs and begin producing cheaper and faster recharging EV batteries in 2026. It says it would own and control the facility with no foreign investment or U.S. tax dollars going to the Chinese company. Rubio is calling for an immediate committee review of the licensing agreement between Ford and the company CATL. A new report sheds light on the looming national debt. It's on track to break a record in five years. Congress is grappling with how to raise the debt limit. Today, Senate leader Chuck Schumer bashed the GOP's proposed spending cuts. Here's NTD's Melina Weiskopf with more. As Congress is pressed to reach a deal on raising the debt limit, House Republicans are pushing for spending cuts they say is meant to lower the deficit. The House Budget Committee recently proposed cutting from areas like uh, cutting recent investments in climate programs or slashing funding that was granted in the recently passed omnibus bill, such as the $3.6 million meant for creating a Michelle Obama trail in Georgia or the $1 million meant for creating a space for gender expansive people of color. Republicans say cuts like this are necessary to get the debt under control. But it sends a statement to the country and to the president that we're here to do business, that we're here to take back the uh, spending and make sure America lives like every family lives according to a budget. In this proposal, House Republicans also aim to save money in programs like SNAP, that is the food stamp program, by establishing income verification. The proposal also uh, suggests capping Obamacare subsidies. Democrats today are pushing back. Reducing affordable child care when we know it is critical. A 30 percent cut in everything affecting people from health care, education. This as President Biden is in Maryland today talking about his plan to reduce the deficit. Here's a look. On March the 9th, I'm going to lay down my entire budget. How much I want to spend, how much we're going to do, everything from taxes cut and raised. These comments come as the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget put out a report revealing that the level of debt is on track to break its record as, the, as a share of the economy in just five years, set to nearly double to around $46 trillion in a decade. I asked Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer what Democrats' solution is for this. Here's his response. Saying that if the current fiscal path stays the same over five, in the next five years, will reach a record in national debt. What is your uh, proposal for solving that? Well, you've seen what we've done already. In the IRA, we actually cut the deficit by $300 um, billion. For every dollar we spent, we put a dollar into deficit reduction. Congress must act to raise the debt limit by this summer in order to avoid an unprecedented debt default, which would cause a ripple effect of economic challenges. Some senators are floating an idea to allow the president to have the sole authority to raise the debt limit on its own without first having to get approval from Congress. I asked Senator Schumer if he supports this, but he did not give an answer. 
Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. And also in Congress, a new bill has been introduced that would stop federal funding to health care providers who deny treatment to patients who haven't received the COVID-19 vaccine. NTD's Arlene Richards reports. A new bill in the Senate would ban funding to institutions that deny health care to patients who have not received the COVID-19 vaccine. Co-sponsor of the bill, Senator Rand Paul, said it will protect the rights of vulnerable patients to make their own health care choices. Robert Moffitt of the Heritage Foundation says the bill is warranted. The right of the patient's right to life to, to live uh, seems to take primacy over anything else. The fundamental question here is whether or not uh, an individual should be denied uh, a life-saving medical procedure because of their concern about a, uh, a medical intervention that may in fact harm them. The bill was created in response to the growing number of unvaccinated organ transplant patients denied treatment. But the legislation, called the COVID-19 Vaccination Non-Discrimination Act, is intended for all patients who haven't gotten the vaccine. Moffitt said patients have a right to treatment, especially if they have a life-threatening condition. The job of a doctor under the traditional Hippocratic Oath, the doctor is a servant of the patient. The doctor's fundamental responsibility is to the patient and to the welfare of the patient before any other consideration. Moffitt said hospitals argue that unvaccinated patients incur a high risk that a procedure such as a transplant won't work and that the number of organs is limited so they would be reserved for patients who have the best chance of survival. A patient rights advocate says there's no scientific basis for this argument. We simply haven't been doing surgeries long enough to have a true you know, placebo or randomized control trial looking at those that got vaccines and those that didn't. This is based on an assumption, an opinion, and a one that really makes no sense. In the end, every patient is a citizen. They're, light, they're allowed to make whatever choices they make. As for the bill, no Democrats have co-sponsored it, and Democrats control the Senate with 51 seats. The fate of the legislation likely hinges on strong Democrat support. Arlene Richards, NTD News. And Republican Congressman Matt Gates won't be charged with any crimes after the Department of Justice concludes its probe. Gates had maintained his innocence since, since the investigation began in 2020. Gates came under investigation over an allegation that he had a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old girl and paid her to travel with him. Senior officials reached out to lawyers for multiple witnesses on Wednesday to inform them of the decision not to prosecute Gates. Prosecutors working on the case recommended against charging Gates in September, in part because of questions over whether central witnesses were credible. Senior department officials made the final decision. And Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley is laying out her 2024 campaign plans. She gave a speech in Charleston, South Carolina, her home state. My purpose is to save our country from the downward spiral of socialism and defeatism. I aim to move America upward toward freedom and strength. I'll take this message far and wide in the days ahead. In her speech, Haley said that she believes in ending inflation, allowing school choice, stopping illegal immigration, enforcing voter ID, and having term limits for Congress. She also said that America needs to have a strong military and be energy independent. Haley was a two-term governor of South Carolina. She also served as the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations during the Trump administration. Haley touted her experience as a former diplomat, and a key theme of her campaign message is a fierce approach to authoritarians. Haley is the first major rival to challenge former President Trump for the GOP nomination. And Ohio's governor this morning said it's safe to return to the area of East Palestine. NTD spoke with a reporter on the ground to get firsthand insight into what the locals say. Ohio Governor Mike DeWine on Wednesday morning told MSNBC that data shows it's safe to return to East Palestine. That's after the local government initiated what they called a controlled burn of toxic chemicals after a train derailment. DeWine says officials will keep testing air and water levels. He advises people in the area to drink bottled water. NTD spoke with Lincoln Jay, a reporter for Rebel News. He's currently on the ground in East Palestine. 
but it's when you start digging a little bit deeper, when you start talking to the locals and you start talking to the residents here, you see that it's not it's not back to normal and many of them are, are very, very concerned. My kids, um, we're just running in to grab something and then we're going back to grandma's house because they keep breaking out in rashes. Jay says many media outlets don't really show the day-to-day -day life of locals in the area and how they're dealing with the situation. A lot of the locals here, a lot of the residents, they feel like they're not being told the truth and they feel like it isn't safe to be here right now. But a lot of them, they just, they don't really have a choice, whether it's they have a mortgage or whatever the case may be. A lot of them are, are simply stuck here and there's, there's really nowhere else to go. So they're in a tough spot. Meanwhile, in Arizona, authorities on Wednesday morning extended a shelter in place order. That's after a truck carrying nitric acid crashed. This caused the chemical to spill over. People driving by the crash site saw these yellow fumes rising into the air. Law enforcement evacuated a 1.5 mile perimeter after the incident on Tuesday afternoon. On Wednesday morning, they extended a shelter in place order from a one mile perimeter to this three mile perimeter. They told residents to turn off heaters and or air conditioning systems that bring in outside air. The CDC describes nitric acid as a highly corrosive, colorless liquid, which can cause an acrid smell. Depending on the amount, the chemical can cause fluid in the lungs, lung inflammation, bronchitis, and dental erosion. Reporting by Arian Pastar, NTD News. And staying in Ohio, today the state's attorney general dismissed charges against a reporter who covered the derailment story. Earlier this month, Evan Lambert was reporting at the governor's press conference about the recent train derailment. Lambert was reportedly told to stop speaking during the presser. Police body cam footage show law enforcement taking him to the ground and arresting him once his live shot ended. Ohio's attorney general today said the reporter was exercising his First Amendment rights. According to the AG, arresting a journalist during a press conference is a serious matter. He added that there wasn't enough evidence to justify the charges. Lambert was charged with resisting arrest and criminal trespass. And Big Tech wasn't invited to the table Tuesday, but it was the center of attention at a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing. The topic, kids' safety and privacy online. And the call, one for action. Here's that story. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the, the Senate Judiciary Committee spent about two and a half hours Tuesday in a rare unified hearing. This cause is truly bipartisan. All of them are bipartisan. It's an issue that keeps parents and children up at night. A psychologist testified the average teen spends more than eight hours a day online. That's more than three times the hearing length. The last time Congress passed a law to protect children online was 25 years ago. On Monday, a CDC survey found increasing mental health challenges among teens. 42% of high school students reported experiencing persistent sadness and hopelessness in 2021. Researchers say social media contributes. Kristen Bride testified that her son Carson didn't get a phone until eighth grade, no social media until ninth. Yet she says precautions did not stop his suicide. Carson had received nearly 100 negative, harassing, sexually explicit, and humiliating messages, including 40 in just one day. She said she could not successfully sue the social media sites because of something called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. It provides legal immunity to websites that moderate user-generated content. Lawmakers are considering limits. Other ideas include creating a digital regulatory commission or setting age limits. Senators promised change and hinted that big tech will be invited to future hearings. If you have any news tips or feedback for our show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. Coming up, a judge in Buffalo today issued a prison sentence for charges including domestic terrorism. The perpetrator is the shooter who attacked a supermarket last year. And sad news in the NHL involving Washington Capitals star Alex Ovechkin, who will be out indefinitely. NTD's Dave Martin has the latest. That and more coming up. Freedom is not free, and neither is the truth. In order to bring you the facts, our reporters are out there on the front lines getting the true story. 
Some of them served 10 years of prison in China. We've been censored on social media. Our Hong Kong printing offices were set on fire, and we've been repeatedly attacked by the Chinese Communist Party. But no matter what, we believe that you deserve the truth, and so we'll continue to bring the truth to light. Head on over to getepic.com and try honor journalism that is based in truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. The man who killed 10 people at a Buffalo supermarket last year was sentenced to life in prison today. Relatives of the victims expressed the pain caused by the attack. Today, when I think of Robbie, I don't think of her like this. I need this picture to remind me. She was a beautiful girl. I think of her alone, laying on the pavement for hours. I've never been able to see or touch her after that day. You will simply go from a name to a number you will be herded like cattle. You will be shut away from the world. One man charged at the perpetrator during the trial. Police were quick to intercept him. The shooter is a 19-year-old white man. He pleaded guilty to state charges, including murder and domestic terrorism motivated by hate. That last crime carries, carries an automatic life sentence. He still faces federal charges that could result in a death sentence if prosecutors choose to seek it. Authorities say he live-streamed a video of the attack on a social media platform and that before the attack, he made an online post indicating that his actions were racially motivated. And we'll keep you updated on that story. Now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Thank you, Steph. Washington Capitals winger Alex Ovechkin will miss the rest of the week, if not longer, to attend to a family matter after announcing his father passed away. Ovechkin posted on Instagram, Today my father passed away. I thank everyone for their support, but ask that you be understanding and not disturb my family at such a hard time for us. Thank you. Capitals coach Peter Laviolette said Tuesday that he doesn't envision Ovechkin will be back for the foreseeable future. Complicating matters is whether Ovechkin needs to travel home to Russia where his parents and family live. Because of the war, there are no direct flights to Moscow from North America. The 37-year-old Ovechkin leads the team with 32 goals this season and recently passed Gordie Howe for second place on the all-time list, now with 812. The former three-time MVP trails Wayne Gretzky by 82 goals for the most ever. And in NFL news, the Las Vegas Raiders have released quarterback Derek Carr. The four-time Pro Bowler was due a guaranteed $32 million salary for next season had he been on the roster another day. The 31-year-old had one of his worst statistical seasons in 2022, despite the team paying a hefty price to acquire star receiver Devontae Adams last offseason. And for your sports viewing schedule tonight, the NBA has 10 games planned featuring the new-look Dallas Mavericks, who are actually 0-2 with Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving playing together. They take on Nikola Jokic and the West leading Denver Nuggets. And in the college game, nine ranked teams are in action, featuring a top 10 matchup in the SEC as number one Alabama takes on 10th ranked Tennessee. And finally, for you hockey fans, the NHL has six games on tap, featuring the Edmonton Oilers and center Connor McDavid, who leads the league with 97 points. They host the Detroit Red Wings. And that's it for your sports news today. Steph? All yours. Thanks, Dave. And finally, Shen Yun Performing Arts is touring around the world. Audience say, audiences say the show resonates with them and brings a universal message. Here's what people had to say after watching the show in Hartford, Connecticut. Powerful, beautiful, and inspiring. 
Shin Yun Performing Arts drew a full house for two performances on February 11th. One audience member, a doctor, brought her mother, two kids, and a friend to see the show. This is out of the world. Congratulations with all my heart. Tears to my eyes when I saw this. It was amazing, beautiful. Uh, yeah, I actually got tears toward the end as well. Uh, the talent and the dedication and the work that these guys have put in is just amazing. The message is a universal message and I've been wanting to see this show for years so I was really glad I could take my mom and kids and friend. But um, truth, compassion, forbearance, I mean what else is going to bring us together after so much of what has gone on environmentally, politically, socially, we really need those three messages. So thank you for that and the beautiful performance. Xin Yun aims to revive genuine traditional Chinese culture through music and dance. I think it's marvelous. It's so sad what's going on socially in the world that this is a very beautiful thing to bring to people all over. Uh, the stories resonated with me, especially the last one. That story actually about the communist suppression of the people trying to express how they felt. That resonated with me. The audience said Shin Yun is bringing powerful values to the world. And the message that is really resonating here is about, you know, compassion, love and forbearance in the future and divine intervention and the hope for humanity and good. You feel uplifted, yeah, after that. The spiritual aspect is also very uh, inspiring. It's got me thinking. It makes me want to grow and be a better person. I think it can help society a lot. I think if more people saw this, they would be happy and feel empowered. Xin Yun is performing in eight cities in the U.S., as well as France, Germany, and South Korea this week. And TV News, Hartford, Connecticut. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Good night. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.